So this chapter is going to be about naming both molecular compounds and ionic compounds. But before we go on to naming the compounds, I want to review these formulas that we learned in the last video, molecular uh, versus ionic formulas, all right? So before we go on to naming, I'm going to go back just a little bit to these formulas we learned in the previous video and talk about the actual structure of the species that they represent. So for instance, this is water. And H2O is a molecular formula because it's referring to two nonmetals, hydrogen and oxygen. And if I make a model of water, this is what it would look like. It actually has this shape uh, verified by spectroscopy. We know the angles to a very precise degree, and we know that this is the structure of the water molecule. Now, it is a molecular compound. It has oxygen and two hydrogens. And each individual water molecule is a discrete entity because it's a molecular compound, not an ionic compound. And so let me show you the difference between a molecule or molecular compound and an ionic compound. This is a representation for the ionic compound sodium chloride. Now, we talked about this. Sodium metal gives up an electron to chlorine, and it forms a chloride anion, which has a negative charge, and a sodium cation, which has a positive charge. Opposite charges attract each other. We've known that for a very, very long time. And so what happens during a, the chemical reaction that forms sodium chloride is you just get positively charged sodium cation, attracted to negatively charged chloride anion, which is attracted to positively charged sodium cation and negatively charged chloride anion, and so on and so on, until it builds up this big clump of matter, which is an ionic compound because it's a substance composed of two different elements, and, but it's a crystal. It's not a discrete molecule. There's no telling how many billions of sodium cations and chloride anions there are in any given clump. What well, you actually can compute that, but there's no discrete molecule for an ionic compound. It's just a big crystal structure, an ordered array of ion. And that's the difference between a molecular compound and an ionic compound. Molecular compounds form these discrete molecules, and ionic compounds form these extended crystalline arrays, two very different types of substance. All right, so HCl, that's a molecular compound, and so that would form discrete molecules of hydrogen chloride. I want to show you this model of glucose. Now, glucose is a fairly complex molecule composed of six carbons, okay? Six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens, and you can count them in this structure. As complex as it, as it is, a single unit of this molecular compound composed of all of nonmetals, carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen, is a molecule of glucose. It's a discrete particle. And if we were to dissolve sugar or, let's say, glucose, a specific type of sugar, into water, it would separate into its own molecules of glucose. You're using this stuff right now. You're using it as fuel to drive metabolism. You're combining one molecule of sugar, of glucose, with six molecules. This is a molecule of an element. This is oxygen, or a representation of oxygen. Uh, it's diatomic. So there's six of these for every one of these. They combine, and when they combine during metabolism, this is what you get. 
you get six molecules of water. You can prove that to yourself by simply breathing on a mirror and you see the water vapor. You also get six molecules of carbon dioxide. This is a molecule of a compound. This is the molecule of a compound. Why is it a compound? Because there are different elements. These are discrete units of the, the, that particular compound, both water and carbon dioxide. So that's what you get when you combine one molecule of glucose with six molecules of the element oxygen, O2. You get six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. Discrete particles, very different from ionic compounds, which are big crystal structures made up of ions. So nomenclature, how to name compounds. So ask yourself the question, is a compound ionic or is it molecular? You know ionic compounds. An ionic compound is made up of a metal and a non-metal. It's a big crystalline structure. Molecular compounds contain only non-metals, you know, those carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, fluorine, those are non-metals. All right, naming molecular compounds. That's pretty easy, okay? You use prefixes to describe the number of atoms of each element in the compound. You have to learn the prefixes. Mono equals one. That is the prefix for one. Di is the prefix for two. Tri, the prefix for three. Tetra, four. Penta, five. Hexa, six. Hepta, seven. Octa, eight. Nona, nine. And Deca, ten. Uh, now, you can come up with your own uh, little memory tricks for these, mono, imano, one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, triangle has three sides, a tricycle has three wheels. Penta, the pentagon has five sides. Hepta, I got nothing for hepta. Nona, I'll leave you with Nona. Uh, a nine. Uh, die, there's two dice, two, tetra. Uh, Tetris, you have four sides to a box and, uh, or a square, and you're trying to get things to match up. Hexa, six. Octa, octopus, has eight arms. Deca, decade, has ten years. Uh, so here are the rules. When you're naming molecular compounds, and remember, molecular compounds are composed only of non-metals. So as soon as a metal creeps in there, you're not talking about a molecular compound, you're talking about an ionic compound. So non-metals only. Don't use mono for the first element in the compound, uh, in the name of the compound. If the compound is binary, that means there are only two elements. So for instance, here's our compound. This is carbon and it's got two oxygens. So the formula is CO2. So we would call it carbon dioxide. Di, because there are two oxygens, and IDE, because it's a binary compound, meaning there's only two elements in the compound. I know there's two oxygen atoms in the compound, but there is only, there are only two elements in the compound. That's what we mean by binary. Carbon, oxygen means it's binary. If it were carbon monoxide, that would be carbon and one oxygen, not two. And so we would call it carbon monoxide. Never use mono for the first element. Okay. Clicker question. Which of the following is true? The classification of HCl and NO2. So the first question is, are they ionic or molecular? Okay, sorry guys, I had to turn that light out. It was in my face. Uh, I, I used it so that you could see the models that I was using. So let's take a look at HCl. Hydrogen, hydrogen is a non-metal. Chlorine is a non-metal. It's a binary compound. So this would be hydrogen chloride and this is definitely a molecular compound. This is You've got nitrogen, which is a nonmetal, oxygen, which is a nonmetal. And so this would be nitrogen dioxide, which is also a molecular 
compound, okay? Nonmetals only mean that it is molecular. If these are both binary compounds because you only have two different elements. Yes, I know you have two oxygens here. That doesn't matter. You just use the prefix di for the oxygen. And remember, never use mono for the first element in the compound. So this is, the answer is D. Uh, HCl, hydrogen chloride, is a molecular compound. We would actually, if we name this correctly, we would call this hydrogen monochloride, but uh, common usage for this particular compound, nobody says hydrogen monochloride, we just say hydrogen chloride. In most molecular compounds, you would use the mono for the chloride. All right, so uh, this is a molecular compound, nitrogen dioxide, dioxide, NO2 is a molecular compound. So this is just a periodic table to remind you that you have over here for HCl, you've got a blue guy, hydrogen, and you've got Cl, which is also a blue guy. These are both nonmetals, so that's a molecular compound. Nitrogen and oxygen, they're both nonmetals, so that's a molecular compound. All right, naming ionic compounds. This is a harder job, all right? You're, the first question you want to ask, is the metal in the compound of known charge? That is, is the metal from group one, group two, is it aluminum, zinc, or silver? And if the answer to that is yes, here are the rules. Just name the metal, then name the nonmetal, use the eyed ending, if the compound is binary, if there are only two uh, elements in the compound. So for instance, this has, uh, this is a representation of sodium and chloride ion. And so this is gonna be sodium chloride. All right, we'll get to the polyatomic anions in a little bit, okay? So here we go. Uh, is the metal in the compound of known charge? That is, is the metal from group one, group two? Is it aluminum, zinc, or silver? So hopefully you can see this fairly well. So here are the group one and group two elements. These guys right here, lithium, beryllium, sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium, rubidium, strontium, cesium, barium. You're really not very often going to have to worry about francium or radium. They're radioactive. You guys aren't going to use them very much. But, and beryllium, you'll, you'll find some uses for beryllium, but uh, really anything in here. These are group one, group two, and group three. And the reason you don't have to name the charge on the metal is because all of these in group one are plus one cations. All of these alkaline earth metals, these are all plus two cations. So you only need to name the metal and then name the non-metal. Now, the same is going to be true for aluminum, zinc, and silver because they all have known charges and it's the only charge they will typically assume in a normal compound. And that is plus three for aluminum, plus two for zinc, plus one for silver, and it just goes straight down the line on the diagonal. All you have to remember is aluminum, zinc, silver, three, two, one. Say it with me. Aluminum, zinc, silver, three, two, one. So for instance, if I had aluminum and chloride. So this is aluminum chloride. That's all you have to say. So this would just be aluminum, uh, or as the British say, aluminium. Okay, so this would just be aluminum chloride. Uh, and then you could have zinc. This would be zinc uh, bromide. Okay, or silver, you're going to learn about this, nitrate. 
Okay? So if you have a group one metal, a group two metal, aluminum, zinc, or silver, all you have to do is say the name of the metal, then the non-metal, use the IDE ending if the compound is binary, and then the appropriate polyatomic anion ending if you have a polyatomic anion. And this is the nitrate anion. We're going to learn about that in just a minute. Naming ionic compounds continue. All right, this is, this is the harder part. This is actually part two for ionic compounds. And this is going to be a little bit more difficult. So here we go. Naming ionic okay. compounds continue. Just remember that if it's ionic, it's a compound composed of a metal and a nonmetal. All right. Is the metal in the compound of known charge? That is, is the metal from group one, group two? Is it aluminum, zinc, or silver? This time, the answer is no. So you have a different set of rules if the metal in the ionic compound is no. Name the metal. Designate the charge on the metal ion by putting the charge in Roman numerals in parentheses. Name the nonmetal. If the compound's binary, it gets the IDE ending. And if the compound isn't binary and you have an, a polyatomic anion, you have to use the correct name. So here we go. Is the comp first question? Is this compound, is it ionic or molecular? Now, all you have to ask yourself, is this composed of two nonmetals, in which case it would be molecular, or is it composed of a metal and a nonmetal? Well, sodium is an alkali metal. It's a group one metal. It's right underneath lithium and has an atomic number 11. Here is oxygen, which is a nonmetal. All right, so this is a non-metal. So this is a metal and a non-metal. So this compound is ionic. Okay, next question. Is this metal of known charge? That is, is it group one, group two, aluminum, zinc, or silver? Well, yes, it's group one. So the rule is name the metal, name the nonmetal, and if it's binary, it gets IDE for an ending. And that's if it's binary. And binary just means two elements. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's not the way to spell elements, but I'm going to leave it to you to fix that. Okay, so here we go. So this is going to be sodium. This is oxygen. So we just give it the IDE ending. And so this is sodium oxide. We don't need to name the charge on this because we already know what the charge is is. If we didn't know what the charge is, we would use the nonmetal to tell what the charge is. And I'll show you how to do that in just a bit. Polyatomic cations. Here we go. It's a long list. There it is. This is the ammonium cation. It's a cation because it's got a positive charge. I'll go ahead and draw the structure for you. And you'll learn how to do this uh, in uh, the second part of the course. This is the Lewis, Lewis structure for the ammonium cation. It is polyatomic. Why is it polyatomic? Because it has many atoms. The prefix poly, poly just means many. 
okay? So it has multiple number of atoms. It's a cation. It has a positive charge, ammonium cation, and you're just going to have to remember the ammonium cation is your polyatomic cation. Now, your polyatomic anions, that's a bit of a longer list. Notice this is page one. Here we go. All right. We've got acetate, azide, cyanide, hydroxide, permanganate, thiocyanate, dichromate, and peroxide. All right. So there are a few of these that you'll need more than others. So acetate is the polyatomic anion uh, for acetic acid and sodium acetate. Uh, you're going to use it a lot, so acetate is definitely one that you need to remember. Now, azide is an interesting anion, and it is the active ingredient in airbags that you find in cars. Sodium azide is what's used in airbags, and you'll see me refer to, refer to it. So it's... <clears throat> It's something that you might want to pay attention to because it's in your environment. Everybody here probably at least rides in a car, if not drives in a car, and airbags in modern cars are everywhere. So sodium azide is the active ingredient in those airbags. You'll learn how to use those or how those work when we get to gas laws. Cyanide. Everybody needs to know what the formula and the charge of cyanide is. Why? Because, because it can kill you. And you always want to know something about things that can kill you, and cyanide is definitely one of those things. So you need to know the formula, you need to know the charge. Hydroxide is essential for your understanding in chemistry. This is the active ingredient in bases. This is what it makes a solution, what we call basic. Okay, so you need to know about hydroxide. It is a polyatomic anion, OH, with a minus one charge. So this is definitely one, this is one. Permanganate is an oxidizing agent. We use it quite a bit. You're going to see it again later in the course. Uh, thiocyanate, anytime you see the prefix thio, uh, you're thinking sulfur and smelly uh, because it generally is, but thio is the prefix for sulfur. Uh, this is dichromate. Uh, you'll see all of these guys. But the three that I've got circled up top are going to be the most important. Peroxides. Peroxides are in your environment, definitely something that you're going to want to pay attention to. You're going to see them around, but I'm not going to emphasize peroxides at this point. These three, I absolutely insist that you know the formula for, the name for, and uh, we're going to use them quite a bit. Uh, if I were to then look at some others, I would say, yeah, you might want to pay attention to azide. You're going to see it later. You may wind up using permanganate in the lab as an oxidizing agent. Uh, and usually in the form of potassium permanganate, it's purple. Uh, thiocyanate, not so much, but remember thio means sulfur. Dichromate, not so much. Peroxides. These guys are in your environment, something that you are going to want to pay attention to. I bet you have hydrogen peroxide in your medicine chest. All right, polyatomic anions too. These, you just need to know them, guys. You, you got to have these in your lexicon of polyatomic ions. Now, I want you to remember that they all end in A-T-E. They all have this in common. And people get very confused uh, with the naming of polyatomic anions and the scheme, uh, the number of oxygens and how they relate to each other. These are all 
called the oxo or oxy anions. And that's obvious, they have oxygen uh, and they have various numbers of oxygen atoms in their respective formulas. So you need to know all of these, chlorate, nitrate, carbonate, chromate, sulfate, and phosphate. You need to know the formula and you need to know the charge. You cannot get along without knowing the formulas. That is, how many, how many oxygens do they have? What is their charge? Okay, and their charge will be the same without respect to the number of oxygens that they have when we go through this naming scheme. All right, hopefully that's clear. You need to know all of these guys. I'm going to focus on chlorate. It's an easy one uh, to use in the naming scheme. All right, using polyatomic anions in naming compounds. This is why you need to know the representative, a, representative ATE ion. So p take your ATE ion, whether it's chlorate, nitrate, carbonate, phosphate, the, the naming scheme is going to be the same. So here's chlorate. It's a ClO3 with a minus one charge. This is the uh, a, somewhat of a Lewis structure for chlorate. We've got a minus charge on it, and we call it chlor eight. Now, what happens if I reduce the number of oxygens? Notice that the charge doesn't change. The charge is still minus one, but the number of oxygens has changed, and so the name is going to change. We're going to go from chlor eight to chlor Ike. Okay, so this will be chlor Ike. Now the same thing would be true if I had nitrate and I removed one oxygen. So just for instance, nitrate is NO3 with a minus one charge and nitrite is NO2 with a minus one charge in the same way that chlorate goes to chlorite. Okay, so this is nitrite. The only thing that's changed is the ending of the name. This is nitrate. We just went from eight to ite, and that's it. Okay, the same thing would be true for phosphate. All right, so here we go. Let's go down one more oxygen. I'm really low in oxygen here, but notice I still have just a minus one charge. Okay, so this is still a minus one charge. Even though I'm way down on oxygen, I, I, I still have the same charge. So we're gonna change the name. We're gonna keep the I-T-E ending, but we're gonna add a prefix, hypo. If you're familiar with uh, hypodermic syringes, hypo means underneath the skin. I interpret that as really low in oxygen, okay? My oxygen content in my polyatomic anion is really low, so I call it hypo, meaning I'm really low in the stuff. But I keep the I-T-E ending. So I've gone from chlorate, to chlorite, to hypochlorite. If I were to have something like this, I would call this hyponitrite, okay? So you've got eight, ite, and hypoite. That's how you think about this, okay? All right. Let's take a look at going the other way. Let's stick with chlorate. And this time, instead of removing an oxygen, we're going to add an oxygen. So one way of saying have yeah, like uh, too much energy is you're really hyper. So I'm thinking, well, we've got more, a lot of oxygen here. And so uh, we're just gonna lose the high, very sad, and keep the purr 
and keep the 8. So this is per chlor 8. Okay? So uh, let's do something with phosphate. So here is PO4 with a 3 minus charge. That's phosphate. So if I had something like this, PO5 with a 3 minus charge, I would call this per phosphate. Okay, so the naming scheme for the oxoanions is really the same, but you have to know the ATE ion. So I'm going to take us back very quickly and take a look at your polyatomic ions. That's why you need to know that chlorate is ClO3, nitrate is NO3, and it's got a minus one charge. Carbonate, carbonate is CO3 with a two minus charge. Okay, and then chromate, C CRO4 with a two minus charge. Sulfate, so you tell me, if I had instead of sulfate, I had SO3 with the two minus charge, what would that be? Well, it's not sulfate because SO4 with a two minus charge is sulfate. This would be sulfite. The ending would change to ITE. And that's the way we do that. If I gave you SO5, with a two minus charge, this would be per sulfate, okay? Just because I've added an oxygen to sulfate, so we add the prefix per, and we keep that A-T-E ending. The charge does not change. So let's name this ionic compound. You know it's ionic because it's got a metal and it's got a polyatomic anion. So uh, is the metal of known charge? The answer is yes, it's a group one alkali metal. It's potassium. I guess uh, that wasn't too big a mystery since I've got all of these is just potassium. Uh, we don't need to name the charge because it's a known charge. And look at this guy right here. Well, let's start out with the ATE version. This is chlor eight. We went to chlorite, but we went all the way down to ClO minus, which is hypochlorite. Okay, so this is potassium hypochlorite. A little bit of practice. What if I had given you something like this, KClO4? What would that have been? Well, it would still be potassium, but it would be per chlor 8. So this would have been potassium per chlor 8. Okay? The per, because I've got an extra oxygen above the ClO3 chlorate polyatomic anion. Okay? All right. Practice. How about this? Ionic or molecular? Well, this is a metal, and it's got a polyatomic anion. So uh, this is an ionic compound. Okay? no prefixes, uh, and is the metal of known charge. That is, is it group one, group two, is it aluminum, is it zinc, or is it silver? And the answer is no. So here's our naming scheme. We need to name the metal. We need to put the charge in Roman numerals in parentheses, and then since this is a polyatomic anion, we need to name the polyatomic anion. Okay? 
anion. All right, so here we go. Now, how do I figure out what the charge is? Well, I look at this guy right here. This is SO4. Mm, let me think back to my list of polyatomic anions. And I remember, well, this is sulfate, and it had a 2 minus charge. Now, all compounds are neutral in charge. That's the nature of compounds. So that means the number of positive charges has to equal the number of negative charges. Since I have one negative two charge over here, so that's negative two, this has to be plus two. So this would be iron. I hope you recognize that Fe is iron. In parentheses, Roman numeral two, and then sol, oops, sol, Fate. Iron 2 sulfate is the name of this compound. What if it had been, what if instead of iron 2 sulfate, it had been FeSO3? Then it would have been iron 2, because the charge doesn't change on this polyatomic anion. It would have been sol fight and do not capitalize that second letter the the second letter here okay don't ca capitalize sulfide you can capitalize the uh, iron if you want but don't capitalize the sulfide okay writing ionic formulas the chemical formula for an ionic compound is always written as an empirical formula, let me remind you of why. Remember, ionic compounds are crystals. And crystals uh, of ions are just made up of ratios of cation to anion. Cation, little blue guys here, to anion, and so on. There are, there are no, I can't tell you exactly how many sodium cations and how many chloride anions are represented in this crystal. I can tell you this, the ratio is one to one, okay? That I can tell you, and that is all I can tell you about an ionic compound, is the ratio of ions to each other. And remember, ion, uh, empirical formulas are just the simplest ratio of ions that are in the compound. And so, uh, we, when we're writing an ionic compound, we always write it as that simplest whole number ratio, like sodium chloride. So here is sodium chloride. Now, all we have to do is balance the charge, because remember, all compounds are neutral. And so, if I want to balance the charge on this compound, uh, all I have to do is do my little crisscross here. Now, I'm not moving the negative charge over here. I'm not moving the positive charge over here. I'm telling myself, how many of these negatively charged chloride ions do I need to balance the positive charge on the sodium cation? That's what I'm doing. There is a, uh, an implied one here and an implied one here. And we never write the ones as subscripts, only if it's greater than one. So the formula for sodium chloride is simply NaCl, understanding that there's a one here and a one here. This is not a molecule. Remember, it's a crystal. It's an extended array, a ratio of one to one in this particular case. All right? All right, let's take a look at the next one. Now, remember, all we're going to do here is we're going to balance charge. The iron, in this case, has a plus three charge. The bromide ion, which is a halogen, it's in group seven, has a minus one charge. If I'm going to make a, an ionic compound out of these two ions, 
I need to have just as many minus one charges as I do plus three charges. So my ratio is going to be three bromide ions to one iron three plus cation. So you can just imagine that up here, I could say, yeah, that's three plus. This is a minus one, but I'm multiplying it times three to get a total negative charge of minus three. The minus three and the plus three, they neutralize each other so that this is a neutrally charged compound. No charge. It's neutral. So the number of negative charges have to balance the number of positive charges. All right. Let's see if you can figure this one out. And by the way, the name of this compound would be iron three bromide. How about this guy over here? This is going to be magnesium nitride. We're going to do the same trick. We are going to just do our little crisscross here. Now, this is telling me I need three plus two magnesiums to balance uh, the two minus three nitrogens. So that's going to give us this formula. Why is this? Think about it this way. Each one of the magnesiums is 2 plus. Each one of the nitrogens is 3 plus. If I split these up just to check out charges, I have 2 times a minus 3, which is a total of negative 6. I have a 3 times a plus 2, which is a total of plus 6. The plus 6 plus the minus 6 equals 0 charge. And all compounds are neutral. So whatever the charges are on the individual ions are, I have to have enough of each to neutralize all charges to get to zero. And remember, all ionic compounds have to be written as empirical formulas. That is, I can't reduce these formula any lower. Let me give you an example. So I want to make a compound out of lead that has a plus four charge and oxygen that has a two minus charge. And I'm going to do that same little crisscross trick. So here it is. I criss cross. Now, what is that telling me I should get? It says, well, I'm going to have two of my plus four leads, so that would be PB subscript two. What's my subscript for oxygen? Oh, I need four of my minus two oxygens, so that's going to be four. And that seems to make sense because that's a minus two, that's a plus four, four times a minus two, that equals negative eight, two times a plus four, that's a plus eight, these are eights, plus eight plus a minus eight equals zero. What's wrong with that? Well, the, this is not written as an empirical formula. And I want to remind you one more time, ionic compounds are written as the simplest ratio of the elements that are in the compound, all right? So they have to be the simplest ratio. So I'm going to divide <laughs> both of these by two. This is going to give me a one. That's going to give me a two. This is lead four oxide. Okay, this is lead four oxide. Now, I can tell it's lead. If, if I were just given the formula, I could tell that it's lead four because I know from the periodic table that the oxygen is minus two. Two times a minus two, that's minus four. All compounds are neutral, so that's got to be a plus four here. So this would be lead. <laughs> I'm out of room. So here's my compound, PbO2. We figured out that's plus four. That's a minus two. This would be lead parentheses, Roman numeral four, it's binary, ox, 
All right. Okay, I think that is, uh, well, let's do one more little slide and then we'll call it a day. All right, this is a long video. Which of the following molecules contains four ions? Well, we'll make short work of this. This is an ionic compound, and the subscript here is one, the subscript here is two, so that's just going to be three ions. What you have here is one magnesium two plus cation, and you have two discrete bromide anions. This is not, this, here's one thing that students do often. With ionic compounds, this does not mean that's a diatomic molecule. That's actually two discrete bromide ions. This, if we split it up, we've got a one here, we've got a one here. If we split that up, uh, calcium is an alkaline earth metal, and in ionic compounds, those all are all plus two ions. And then we have one polyatomic carbonate ion with a minus two. So that's one ion plus one ion, and that equals two total ions. This is aluminum nitrate. We're going to split this up. Now, whenever I have a set of parentheses like I have here, Everything inside the parentheses is multiplied by the subscript outside the parentheses. So that's going to give me one aluminum ion. And if you remember from the periodic table, aluminum is that plus three ion. It's always plus three. It's never different. And then you're going to have three polyatomic anions. That's one plus three or four ions. And then finally, we've got this. This is your one polyatomic cation. Remember, we've got parentheses here, and there's a subscript two. That means I have two of those. So I have two NH4 ammonium cations, and I have one chromate two minus anion. Okay, I got two plus ones and one minus two ions. So that's two ions. And then here I've got a molecular compound. This is actually acetylene, kind of looks like this. And you got a hydrogen out here. That's a molecule. And that is a molecular compound. So it has zero ions. Remember, ionic compounds have ions. Molecular compounds are made up of atoms. And that, ladies and gentlemen, I think is enough for today.